Shabbat Shalom. Uh, I'm broadcasting from Wenatchee in Washington in the USA. I'm so glad to be home. Uh, it was very emotional when I got here. I was so happy. Um, and, you know, I love Israel. I love Israel, but that's not where I want to live right now. I want to live here. Uh, I, I've spent many, many years in Israel. It's it's where I grew up, but that's not where I want to live. Um, I'm very happy here in Wenatchee, and so I was glad to be home. And uh, one of the things I missed about Israel, right off the top, was there was no Christmas stuff going on over there. And as soon as I got here to the States, it was just everywhere. Christmas music blasting in the in the stores, Christmas trees everywhere, Christmas decorations and lights and Santa Claus and just all of, all of it. And I'll tell you, I didn't miss that in Israel. It was nice not having all that stuff being rammed down your throat. You, you may not even realize it here. Because you, it's you've been here you know all your life, and uh, unless you're somewhere else, uh, you may not realize how it's being crammed down your throat here. Uh, so I, I don't miss. I didn't miss that Christmas stuff uh, at all. Um, so I'm glad to be here. Um, it was a difficult time over there because of the circumstances and uh, the bureaucracy in Israel. Um, it was just very, very difficult. Um, and we all did the best we could, you know. Uh, uh, Rabbi Ariel and Yocha, I mean, they still had to make a living while I was there, you know, and one of the things that they do is they take, uh, tours, they take, they guide people around Israel, uh, sometimes it's groups, sometimes it's individuals or couples, and, uh, they had a couple there when I got there, so they had to kind of divide their time up between taking this couple around, uh, and trying to help me as best they could, so that was hard for me because there was things like I only had X amount of time. And I thought this all was going to be done within a week or two weeks max. So I'm like, okay, let's get there. Let's get this done. Da, da, da. And then you can keep touring your people around. But they had to, you know, they couldn't just put them off, off to the side for two weeks either. And then Yoha had some problems with the pregnancy. So that made it hard on her emotionally, you know, of course, and, uh, so it was just, uh, a very, very difficult time, and we had somebody that came on Facebook, and they're all like, oh, you're so blessed to be in Israel, and there you are complaining, and you're, this is where Jesus walked, and all this kind of thing, and it's like, you know what, you don't understand, you haven't been here. You don't know what it's like here. Uh, so you can consider me to be... And we used to get people like that all the time uh, when we were in Israel. They come over and they got their heads in the clouds. Oh, it's the Holy Land. And, they, you know, and it is, and it's good that it's the Holy Land. But they got their heads so far up in the clouds, they didn't see the tank that was headed right for them. You know, the spiritual tank. And they get run over and run home, and a lot of them would even lose their faith over it. Or they were just, I don't understand how all those things happened to me. And, and I was just so happy to, to be where Jesus walked, and they weren't prepared. Whereas if you got your eyes open and you see the problems in Israel, uh, you can actually deal with it a lot better. When you see that tank coming, sometimes, you know, i got to step out the way. <laughs> you know? So, 
uh, and, and I don't begrudge them, but, you know, don't try to tell me how to feel and how I should be looking at things. Um, we have leadership that if I'm going in the wrong direction, they, they are more than uh, enabled <laughs> to tell me. So it may come across as complaining and stuff like that, but I'm just being a, I'm just being a realist. I'm just telling you what it's really like. So uh, by the time it was time for me to leave, uh, I thought, you know, I just, I mean, I was 95% still sure that it was going to happen. You know, once we uh, talked to the IDF and they gave us their okay, and we found out some other good things, like there's no back taxes on land, that was great news. Uh, and we found out that uh, they will include us into the community in, uh, in uh, Hargilo. That was good news. I mean, we had we accomplished some things, but there was nothing that you could see that was tangible, you know, where I could take pictures of it and then go, okay, look here, we have a, you know, we have a a, a, a trailer on the property and and just things like that that I could really promote when I got home. So the goals had not been met. The goals had not things had been done, but the goals had not been accomplished. So by the time the day that I was leaving, I was I just felt completely defeated. Even though we'd had some things accomplished, I just felt like the main goals had not happened. And I was just drained emotionally, uh, mentally. I mean, I had even gotten a lot of sleep because I was constantly thinking, okay, how do I do this? How do we get this to happen? And lots of stuff and so i was just completely uh drained and felt defeated so it was like i don't know the night that i was leaving i say six hours but i think it was probably closer to eight hours before i left uh rabbi ariel says there's somebody i want you to meet and initially i said no I said, I'm tired. I don't want to meet anybody else. And he's like, no, you should, you know, in, you should meet him. I said, all right. Well, that's fine. And then uh, he got a phone call and he said, that was my sister. We think the title came through. And that's a big deal. I mean, that's a huge deal. Because if we got the title, nobody can contest you know, when we start building, if the Greek Orthodox come out or somebody else tries to contest it, there's, it's not going. They're not going to be able to. I mean, it's uh, the title is in my name, and they're not going to be able to do anything about it. So it was a big, big deal. That's something my dad tried to get for years and couldn't get. So, uh, I mean, he could have if he'd have kept, kept pushing, but. You know, he just got to a point where I think, you know, he just felt he just gave up. Um, because even if he'd have gotten the title then, back then you couldn't build there. It was on the green line. Uh, it, it's not anymore. Now it's part of Hargilo. Uh, the community of Hargilo. So getting that was a huge, huge deal. And I was just like, well, can we go get it? Because when we ordered it, when we put the paperwork through, uh, they needed an address to send it to. Well, I was going to be gone. And I was thinking this is going to take months, you know, again, with the bureaucracy and Israel and all. So we gave Ariel's address. So that's where it went to. Well, he, he lives up in Harish. That's two hours north or more depending on traffic and so uh but i wanted that title in my hand i wanted to come back to wenatchee with that in my hand so i said can we go get it and he's like it's you know two hours or more up there and then two hours back and i was leaving in 
by that time, probably, you know, about six to eight hours. And I said, I need to have it. And they, they talked to each other. And Yocha, the poor thing, she was exhausted. And, and she had been driving literally for a month from the day I got there because Ariel doesn't have a, a license. And I did help her when she had the automatic. Uh, I did a little bit of the driving for her just so she could rest. Uh, but then they got this stick shift, and I can drive a stick, but you don't want to drive a stick in Israel. It's really difficult, but Yocha is good at it. So uh, I said, are you, sure, you sure you could do this? And she goes, let's go. And so we drove up there. Uh, it was crazy. It was crazy because we had to hurry. So she's flying. I mean, just flying up there. And the back window had broken. So in the in the daytime, it was warm in Israel. But at night, it got cold. You know, it's kind of like the desert. It gets real cold at night. So that cold air, and all I had was my summer clothes. I wasn't expected to be in Israel. I packed for the tropics. Because I was going to be in Israel before it got cold. For like a week and then i was going to go to asia um so all i had were shorts and, and t-shirts basically so that cold air was just and thankfully i'm from the north i mean i've i've, I've cut i'm accustomed to the north up here i've gotten used to the cold in washington uh but still it was and i thought oh, i'm gonna get sick for sure because I always get sick on the trips. I'm always getting sick. I get sick here at home a lot too. Except during COVID. Two years I never got sick. I never once got sick during the COVID. The, the main parts of COVID. Uh, at the end of it I did. But not through the whole two years of it. <clears throat> so I thought oh, I'm going to be sick on the, the whole trip home. So we flew up there. We grabbed it, got back in time for my flight, uh, got on the plane, and I'm just waiting for the sickness. And I had been sick. I got sick as soon as I got there uh, when I first arrived in Israel. So it never really went away, but I thought it was going to get much, much worse. I thought I'd be like going into fevers, and I've had that happen on the planes before. Um, and it was just horrible. But I thought I'd get sick. Uh, got on the plane, and from that point on, everything, I mean, I don't travel well. I was in a lot of pain because I have back pain, and, and so I can't travel. I can't sit for long periods of time. and it, So I had to take some medication, some pain uh, killers. But really, the rest of the trip went incredibly smoothly. So going over... I had to stand in line for about three and a half hours at Heathrow because Heathrow, what they're doing now, it doesn't matter where you're coming from, where you're flying in from, you have to go through their security again. So everybody coming from every airport just to transfer has to go through another security check. And it was just absurd. And I noticed I was, and coming back too, it was the same. I was the oldest guy in the, that was traveling. Everybody else. Now, there might have been one that I didn't see. It was a huge line. We're talking miles. Uh, but everybody I could see was younger than me. And I'm not that old. I'm only 55. But everybody else was much younger so apparently the elderly people are realizing this is not a good time to travel because you're going to be standing in very, very long lines. So it's difficult. But on the way back, I seem to have, they'd open up a new security thing. And I get to go through, not maybe first, but just a few people back. And so I got to go right through. And everything seemed to be working very smoothly. But I want to back up. So we got the title. 
that was huge. That for me was enough. If that's all I could do on that trip, fantastic. I'll take it. But then, just before we were going to leave to go up to get it, Ariel says, my friend is here. Or he's coming. My friend is coming. This is like 10 minutes before his friend got there. I'm like, okay. So I'm kind of preparing. I'm thinking, let's get this meeting over with as soon as possible so we can get on the road and get up there. And in case something happens to the car, you know, I'm not going to miss my flight. Because, I mean, I, w I wanted to be on that flight if it killed me. I did not want to miss that flight. So then it gets down to about five minutes before the guy gets there. And Ariel tells me, he says, uh, the person you're going to meet is the son of the chief rabbi of Israel. And I thought, okay, we probably got a communication problem here. <laughs> right? I said, okay, so who is this uh, chief rabbi? Right? And he said, David Lau. I said, the David Lau? And he's like, yes. And I'm like, he's the chief rabbi of the Ashkenazi. He's the most influential Jew in the world. We're going to meet his son? He's like, yes. I couldn't believe my ears. And here we are, this, the hotel, the, it wasn't even a hotel, where we, where I was staying then was a hostel. And it's just an absolute dump. You know, it was like 50 bucks a night or something like that in Israel. It's, that's like the worst of the worst. And now here's coming the son of the chief rabbi of Israel. So in Israel, in Judaism, you have two chief rabbis, okay? You have uh, the chief rabbi of the Ashkenazi. So the Ashkenazi Jews are all the Jews north of Spain. And then you have the chief rabbi who's the chief rabbi for the Sephardi, for the Sephardic, Sephardi in Hebrew. And that's all the Jews from Spain and south. So there's... North of Spain is the Ashkenazic Spain, and south of Spain is the Sephardic Jews. And we have a lot of respect for the Sephardic as Messianics because they keep a lot more of the older customs, you know, the more uh, biblical customs. But the, but the Ashkenazic chief rabbi is much more powerful. Uh more people, uh, more funding, more power, more everything. And he's coming to my room. <laughs> right? <laughs> so I start to get a little bit, you know, this is, this is a big deal. And I, uh, I don't even have, I'm not even dressed in my good clothes. I mean, this is the kind of meeting you'd have like at the, the King David Hotel, not this dump room where I was at. But, and then uh, he, we hear the buzzer, and he's like, he's here. I'm like, okay. And he comes up, and it's like these guys have been friends for years. They give each other a hug. They're all happy. Hey, great to see you. I mean, everything was in Hebrew, but, you know, there's that kind of an idea. It's good to see you. And, and then he sits down, and... He starts talking about uh, uh, <clears throat> he wants to bring an understanding or educate, <clears throat> have an understanding between Messianics and the Orthodox and kind of work together. I couldn't believe my ears. But I did realize, and I do realize, there, there's, there's things that are, there's something happening in Israel. Now, before, uh, we used to have, where most of the Israelis just, uh, or it's, uh, not most, a lot of Israelis, did not 
they don't just don't like messianics. Uh, they try to demonize us, say, you know, we're trying to trick Jews and all this kind of thing, which we're not. Um, so they just try to make us really out to be these bad guys. But lately, through Beta Venu and through Rabbi Ariel, there are rabbis that are being exposed who are messianics. And we're not just talking about just regular, you know, your everyday Jews. These are Hasidic rabbis that are coming to Yeshua. So there's other Israelis who are starting to think, you know what, this isn't going away. There's more. There's over 10,000 Messianics now in Israel. This isn't a problem that's just going to disappear. So we can. the more we demonize it, the more it seems to flourish. So there's another group of Israelis that are thinking, you know, maybe we should try to understand it better. You know, and that's where I think the chief rabbi's son is coming from. He's like, you know, let's see if we can learn from each other. Maybe have a better understanding. But this has never happened on such a high level. In fact, he wants to work with us in the yeshiva that we have, that we're going to be building in Israel on our property. He even has a course that he wants to teach at our yeshiva. The way I understand it, now, none of this is in stone. This is going to translation because they were speaking so fast. I could only pick out about two-thirds of what they were saying in Hebrew because they were speaking so fast and my Hebrew was getting more and more rusty. But then he, then uh, Rabbi Ariel would translate it in Spanish because Rabbi Ariel's English is, is, isn't so good. And he would translate it to, her, to Yocha his wife in Spanish, then she would translate it to me. And her English is, is better, but it's still, you know, it's it's broken English. But from the way I understand it, and I'll get verification from this, because uh, I'm going to write Yocha a letter and say, is, do I understand this properly? Is this correct? And da, da, da. But I'm pretty sure. Because again, I did hear a lot of it in Hebrew. So there's certain things that I, I know for sure. <clears throat> but he wants to teach a course in our yeshiva once we get it built. Well, what that means is Beta Venu, Torah Light, people who want to do the yeshiva and go to Israel and stay in Israel while they study. The chief rabbi's son is going to be one of their professors. But he's not born again. He's not even a believer. Well, he's not teaching courses on theology. Hang on just a second. I get something to drink. There we go. He showed us his course list. And most of the stuff that he wants to teach, even though he's an Orthodox Jew, of course, uh, most of the stuff he wants to teach <coughs> has to do with Jewish history. So he can teach that all day long, as far as I'm concerned. And this will afford not only a good education in Jewish history. This, this guy is really smart. I mean, he is really smart, very educated. But it will also give them an opportunity to meet and establish, you know, a relationship with the chief rabbi's son. Now, I keep calling him the son because I don't want to give his name on the internet. I will be giving his name here at, in uh, the, the class today, but I'm recording this specifically for the internet. This morning, it will not be on the internet. I'm going to be giving a lot more details. Uh, if there's things that you want to know, and I know you well, uh, write in, and I can fill you in if there's any additional information you want to know. But I have to be able to trust the people that 
uh, I give his name to. So anyways, while this whole thing is going on, I mean, I looked over at Yocha, and I don't know if she realized this, but her mouth was on the floor. She's like, wow, wow, we were just understanding the magnet, the, ugh. it was the biggest meeting of my life. It was the biggest meeting of my life to hear someone in that position to say they wanted to work with messianics. There's not a messianic alive who would have dreamed this 10 years ago, maybe not even five years ago. I don't think I was dreaming it that day. <laughs> You know, we couldn't believe our ears. And he only, he wants to do this only through us, only through Rabbi Ariel and Beta Venu, right? Rabbi Ariel's Beta Venu. So this is something that is exclusive to us, which is amazing. Every other messianic organization I know would kill, not literally, but would kill to have this kind of opportunity. This is making history. And it's just, it's overwhelming. I got to tell you, it is absolutely humbling and overwhelming. I'm still in shock. This is th four days later, three, four days later, and I am still in shock. And everyone there was. I mean, we, we couldn't have even... We we're like, what is happening? What is happening right now? It's just unbelievable. So... He's very excited about our yeshiva. And the way I understand, he's, he's even talking about, you know, he uh, might help fund it. So we'll see. We'll see what, what all pans out, how it works out. Because, uh, I mean, this guy, if he wanted to, he could blink and build the hotel. The ultimate goal is to build a hotel on the top floor, it's going to be a three-story building, hotel on the top, yeshiva slash synagogue in the middle, and then uh, staff and housing on the bottom. Housing for people that, you know, uh, need help financially, believers that get into a particular kind of situation, or, you know, or anyone that we feel needs help uh, and a job we would be able to provide that for them. And then, of course, the top, we would rent out. You know, we'd, we'd have rooms. It'd be just like a regular hotel um, on the top level. I don't know how big, as big as we can do. You know, if we could do four stories, we're going to do four stories. If we can do ten stories, we're, whatever they allow us to do, that's what we're going to shoot for. We're We're going big. Because we're going to put out information to every Messianic organization out there, to every church, Christian Zionist organization out there, that if they want to help with this uh, project, that you know they can be a part of it. And I can't imagine any uh, Zionist organization that wouldn't want to have a part in building something in Israel. We're the only ones doing this. Nobody else is doing anything, not even close to this. And to have the opportunity to meet with uh, uh, the son of the chief rabbi of Israel, that is really quite an honor. So whoever wants to be a part of this, uh, we're going to let them be included. Um. And we'll rent those rooms out to, you know, whoever. People say, well, shouldn't you only rent it out to only believers, the, the rooms? It's like, no, it's a hotel, just like any other business. 
Somebody wants to come and rent a room, they can come and rent a room. You know, if you have a gas station and you're a believer, you don't say, well, you know, only believers can come and fill up their cars here. You know, that'd be silly. So we'll rent out the rooms to who, whoever. Uh, and the yeshiva will be a great opportunity for people to come and study in the land. I'll use all my connections in archaeology and the archaeological world over there. So they'll have the best uh, teachers and the best opportunities to dig while they're there. Uh, they'll be digging uh, on, you know, on Mount Zion, the, uh, the, the projects that we do uh, that are connected to Mount Zion. Uh, down south as well, there's some digs that we're involved in. So they'll have those opportunities. Um, and then we'll get some, the next thing I'll do is start talking to some of the uh, uh, believers who teach at the uh, university, the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and have them come and do, and I've already made a whole bunch of connections over there with some other institutes. Uh, one of them is specializes in advanced Hebrew, and they we've already talked and we've established a relationship. And we're going to get our students involved with them. And they'll come up and, st and teach at our yeshiva. Um, just big, big things have been happening. And it's very, very exciting. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this is the biggest thing that's ever happened in Israel. I can't think of anything bigger that's happened with Messianics than, than this. It's just huge. And we're at the forefront of it. So we're humbled by that. We're amazed. And we just, you know, and I'm going through every day, I'm telling you, in fear and trembling. Because I don't want to mess this up. I want to, I'm being super careful of every single thing I say, every single step I take, and I'm just putting every bit of thought that I have into this because I don't want to mess it up. Um, I just want to be an instrument for Hashem and, ha and just have Him use me in whatever way He thinks is best. And, uh, and I'm just amazed absolutely amazed i've never seen anything like this in not only my ministry but in my parents ministry or any other messianic ministry this is the big this is the moment we're walking into a different era folks this is a different era we've never seen anything like this before so you need to get ready you need to get ready. Things are changing. I'm telling you, like through it, when I met with him, that day, the world changed. The world changed. Because this has never happened before. We have Messianic rabbis uh, that are Hasidic, converting, more than we've ever seen ever. Uh, people in high positions accepting messianics, wanting to work with them. We've never seen this. Things are changing. And I got a feeling it's going to be for most people, it's going to be sink or swim. Because they're going to change and they're going to change fast. When we get this many Jewish people, Focusing on the New Testament, focusing on the words of Yeshua, things excel very quickly. The amount of knowledge that blooms from this goes very quickly. And if you want to be stuck in your old Christian doctrine, you're going to be left behind. So keep up with it. Uh, if you don't know where to turn, watch Beta Venu. We're not the only ones that are teaching Messianic Judaism and Torah observance. But if you don't 
have someone else get involved with us. Tune in to the teachings that we do. They're free. Tune in to the teachings we do every Saturday. We struggle with the, uh, you know, getting it online and we struggle with the technology of it, you know, but stick with it. Keep trying. Don't give up on it. Well, I couldn't get on this Saturday, so I'm not going to go anymore. Then you are going to be left behind. Big things are coming. And I'm a pessimist. Okay? I don't say big things are coming if I don't think so. Because I'm going to be like, eh, you know. <laughs> I'm a pessimist. But I am seeing huge things coming down the pike. Things that I don't even know if I'm ready for. If I'm going to be transparent with you. I don't even know if I'm ready for it. So if I ain't ready for it, and you're not totally on board with Hashem, with Messianic Judaism and the truth, you certainly won't be ready for it. And that's just a friendly heads up. So, otherwise, you know, I'm not trying to scare anybody either. I'm just saying, you better be all in. Uh... Because big things are going to happen. There's going to be a, a huge separation of the wheat and the chaff. And I know we've heard that all those years growing up. But not it's, it's going to happen not in a way that we thought it, it was going to happen. It's going to be a, a very different thing. It's going to be there are those who believe in the law. And those who don't. And those who don't are going to be blown away. That's going to be the dividing line. So... Anyways, uh, like I said, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm excited. I mean, there's big things coming. Yes, I'm nervous. I'm nervous about it. And it's, there's a little bit of anxiety there, I got to tell you. But overall, it's very exciting and very hopeful. Uh, this is an incredible time. Now, I'm not saying it's the end days. Okay? But I'll tell you this. If what didn't happen four days ago, and I'm not saying just, you know, this he could have done this with somebody else. It could have been another, I'm not saying it's because of us. But that kind of thing had to happen before the end days could happen. <coughs> you couldn't have it happen without it. There has to be that kind of collaboration that starts to where the Jews can say, you know what, let's talk to the Messianics. Because the Great Revival can't happen until that happens. And then once it starts spreading, it gets more and more known. Then you're going to have the 144,000 that are going to come to Yeshua. That can't happen unless th this kind of thing happens first. You see what I'm saying? Again, I'm not saying because of us. I'm saying this kind of thing had to happen. If it wasn't with us, it would have to have happened with somebody else. And it would have. Prophecy will happen. But And I'm not even saying we're in the last days now. I'm just saying this had has to happen first. Boy, did it happen. It happened like I couldn't believe. I could not believe what I was hearing. So that gave me strength for the ride home. It was such a easy... I mean, I was still in a lot of pain because I can't sit for long periods of time, but that's not the worst parts of traveling, dealing with the pain. Uh, and then I got back to Seattle, and I stayed there for a couple of nights, I think two nights. Uh, there, All the flights over here to Wenatchee had been canceled because of the snow. And the fog, there was a lot of fog up there on the, at the airport here. And then uh, Joanne called. She said, we're going to come and get you. I said, well, why don't you wait a couple days? She's like, no, we're coming to get you now. So her and Les came over the mountains. And, and the, the roads were, were pretty good. I mean, they, they'd done good. There was snow everywhere. I'll put pictures up. There was a ton of snow. But the roads were really good. So they, even that was a fairly smooth, that was a smooth ride <clears throat> coming over. 
And then I got here to the synagogue and it was freezing inside of here. So they had a couple little heaters out in the front, but it was still cold. And the back was like ice. I took out uh, some meat to thaw because I was planning, you know, on making dinner. And it never thawed. <laughs> it just stayed frozen out there. <laughs> so I went to Walmart and got a couple of uh, heaters before Shabbat. And, uh, but it's going to take some time. It's going to take, and then I plugged them in and then all the circuit breakers in here just went crazy because this is an old building and the electrical here is terrible, absolutely terrible. So for hours I'm having to switch the plugs. Okay, will it pop this one? Do I do this one? Da, da, da. Uh, and I got it fairly warm and been this, this, this is my bedroom here. So I got, I got it fairly warm in here and I went to sleep at. <clears throat> nine woke up at three wide awake and as soon as i woke up i'm like it's time to go get some shawarma then i'm like wait a second <laughs> uh i'm not in israel anymore uh so then uh i realized i was back back home and i'm really glad to be here so that's my report for the last week in the last hours when I left, the biggest things ever happened to us. And I thought we were done. I thought it was over. And I, I wouldn't, could not have foreseen what happened. And Ariel and him are just giving each, they say goodbye, they're giving each other hugs. And, you know, and I, I got to know him. He really liked me. I mean, I, I cracked a few jokes during the meeting and made everybody laugh and, and I could literally call him anytime I wanted to. I could call to his office, ask for him, and say, just let him know it's Rabbi Stanley. And uh, he'd be answering the phone and be, you know, just like we'd known each other for all, all these years. We got along great. So I'm looking forward to a long, uh, happy relationship with him. Uh, he's a really nice guy. Uh, very, very smart. Uh... So it was, uh, it was the meeting of a lifetime. And I've met, you know, some, my fair share of important people, you know, like I met the head of the U, not that this is a good thing necessarily, but I had the, met the head of the UNRWA, uh, years ago. He employed more people in the state of Israel. So he is an important person. Uh, my brother, you know, is friends with the prime minister of, of Canada and so there's connections there and things, but for me, this was by far the most important meeting I'd ever, ever been in. It was quite impressive. And soon I'm going to be going over to uh, Moscow uh, and meeting with the uh, Minister, Secretary of Defense of Russia. So that'll be a big meeting. But even that, to me... <coughs> <laughs> That's nothing compared to the meeting I had with the chief rabbi's son. So, and it may be the biggest meeting I ever have in the future. Who knows? But uh, keep praying. Keep praying. Big things are happening. And uh, we won this battle. We want it clearly. So Baruch Hashem and Shabbat Shalom. Bye-bye.